understand the economy, you have to understand human nature. This podcast is powered by Acast. How are you doing there? It is time. How are you doing for, there? That's John's <laughs> Katie Taylor impression. Stop. I have to say that Katie Taylor is without a doubt, I don't know if you saw that fight the other night, but she is without a doubt, I think, the best Irish sports person Un- ever, ever. Unbelievable. Ever. Unbelievable. Far better than any yeah. of the blokes, any of the, you know, any of them. She's yeah. just amazing. And, and not only that, she's a really, really nice person. She's a very, very nice person. And people are talking about that fight between herself and Moreno as being the Ali versus Foreman rumble in the jungle of female boxing. Right. It was such an unbelievably intense, vicious contest. Mm. And when you contrast that with the nonsense that went after of (laughs) Tyson, who was our age, (laughs) he's even older than us, John, going up against an internet sensation. He was actually the worst of all society. It's, It's mediocrity dressed up as brilliance. Yeah. It is a shakedown of people. It is morally, all the values are wrong. Yeah. It's, yeah. Yeah. it's actually what is wrong with celebrity culture. You know, to dress that thing up yeah. as a gladiatorial contest between athletes. You know, that, anyway, I'm getting... I'm yeah, he's, going, he's off, he's off. Okay, he's off. I, today, the podcast today is going to be on the immediate effects of Trumpism on Europe and Ireland. We're going to look the Irish election. I don't know about you, but if you're into Mars bars and Twixes, this is the election for you, right? (laughs) That our politicians, I don't know if you've noticed this, basically have infantilized the Irish population so much that all they're doing is saying, you see all that American money, all that American money that we got in, right? The stuff that was over in a jar Mm. over the telly, we're going to actually spend it all on Twixes and quality streets and selection boxes yeah. and give it out to everybody, right? So it's free this, free that, every single... Pol- I mean, it is lamentable. Mm. Every single initiative in this election, which started with the mini-budget eight weeks ago, is nothing more than treating the electorate as children in a sweet shop. and say. Yeah. How many Twixes would you like? Oh, we'll give you five of those, right? We'll give you Mars Bar, Maltesers, you want them? Yeah, we'll give you them, right? And we, the people, have allowed ourselves to become infantilized. The podcast, John, has always said, you get lots of money in the back door, you use it productively for things that have a long-term productive capacity that increase the productivity of the nation. Yeah. So that's trains, houses, metro systems, etc. Things that we will have into perpetuity. Yeah. What are they doing now? They're using all the American money, which may go after Trump. This is the point. Mm. And they are using it simply as a sugar rush to buy votes. Yes, a and sugar just, rush election. I know, it's, it's dreadful nonsense. And I'm, we're, going, we're going to list the amount of free things that have been given out after this. And the reason I want to tie it together with Trumpism is it's very, very clear that the world has shifted on its axis economically. Mm. One of the factors at risk is the Irish economic model and the money from America, whatever you want to call it, right? There is a good chance, number one, that A, the tariffs will affect us disproportionately because we have a massive trade surplus with America and they don't like that. Yeah. B... Your friend, RFK. There's a, <laughs> Not my friend. There's a Kennedy in the White House. <laughs> His target are the very large pharma companies that are generating yeah. our massive, massive trade and budget surplus. Yeah. So there's a double pincer here, right? And of course, what the Irish politicians are saying, don't worry, more Mars bars, more Twixes. Yeah. I mean, As I was saying to you before, it feels like when you, when you put it in that context, it feels like kind of championship league against the Premier League in terms of politicians. Completely. They're just not really switched on to the world, unless there's something going on in the background, which we don't see, but... No, there's not. I can tell you there's not. Right, it feels like they're just not at the races. So we're going to come back to the Irish election in the second part of today's podcast. Mm. But what I want to start with now 
something that really intrigues me, which was in the last couple of days, Olaf Schultz, the Chancellor of Germany, has phoned up Putin to have a chat. Now, this was described by Zelensky, who didn't know about this, Mm. as opening a Pandora's box and giving Putin everything that he has wanted for the last two years, which is legitimacy, which is credibility, which is your back at the table, etc. Now, of course, I want to talk about, this is the biggest thing, this is Trumpism. Yeah. This is the immediate impact of Trump, because what it is, is Trump has said to the Germans, go and lead a deal with the Russians. And what's the collateral damage? Ukraine. Do you know if Trump actually said that or the Trump team said? No, no, but this is what happens. Like The Germans picked up the phone to Putin two yeah. days after yeah. Trump is announcing his MAGA cabinet, okay? Yeah. Not having spoken to Putin for two years since the yeah, yeah, invasion, yeah. right? Yeah. The whole Western approach to Putin after the invasion, isolate him. Yeah. Make him a pariah. San- sanction up the Sanc- yin yang, right, okay. which, which didn't, didn't work. But I'm just going to tell you, I'm going to bring you back, historically, John, to the 23rd of August, 1939. Okay. When the world awoke to something called the molotov ribbentrop Pact, which was an alliance between Nazi Germany and the communist Soviet Union, which divided up Eastern Europe. Half of Poland went to Germany, half of Poland went to the Soviet Union. Lithuania, Latvia, Estonia were given to the Soviet Union. These were independent countries. Yeah. Bessarabia, which is now between Romania and Moldova, a very old, old, old Romanian-speaking area given to the Soviet Union, right? The whole thing carved up, right? This smacks to me of exactly the same thing. Why? Explain that a bit more. What what do you think is going to happen in this? We've said it a few times in the podcast, right? The most natural alliance between countries are alliances where economics, diplomacy, and demography line up together. Mm. The most natural alliance in Europe, Central Europe, is between Germany, which is a country with enormous industry and no energy, Mm -hmm. and Russia, a country with enormous energy and no industry. Right, you you have an alliance between those two. There's a German trade of capital goods and know-how going from Germany in the west to Russia in the east, mm. and there is Russian hard commodities, oil and gas, going from Russia in the east to the west. Now, in between the meat and this sandwich is the Central Europeans. Yeah, Ukraine is today what Poland was in the 1930s a buffer state between Germany and the Soviet Union. And the Germans will betray anyone in Central Europe to bolster their relationship with Russia and to make sure that Russia isn't a threat with them because they are still petrified after the Second World War. Okay. And what you have now is Schultz. I mean, he wasn't phoning Putin to say, did you see the tennis last night? (laughs) Okay. He wasn't phoning Putin to say, I think... Did you see Katie Taylor? Yeah, yeah. I, I think the high press of Borussia Dortmund <laughs> is really effective. I guess, yeah. you know, he was wrote, he was phoning Putin to discuss the terms of the surrender of Ukraine. There's no doubt in my mind, right? Okay. Can, can and I just, this is Trumpism. Yes, yeah, I can see that. This is from almost immediately... He's getting things, other things people to have do his started job. moving. Yeah. Oh, oh, that's what I'm saying. Immediately, the world has changed yeah. straight away. So, the difference, though, between 1939 and now is that Germany are part of the European Union. They are part of the European Union. They are part of NATO. They are part of the G7. They're part of everything. There's no doubt of that. Yeah. But what is interesting to me is the movement from Germany is first, it is a movement that is only going to lead to better terms for Putin. But it's also a total betrayal of the Ukrainians. Yeah. Because the Ukrainians' position has always been, at least we have friends in the West who 
will not talk to Russia. Yeah. Now, you can argue that there has to be a peace, that there are far too many young men dying, yeah. that this is a ridiculous war of attrition, that yes, Russia is the aggressor, but sometimes geography plays you a bad hand, and the bad hand the Ukrainians have been played is that they live beside the Russians, right? Yeah. You can argue all that, right? And that's what will be argued in the future. But what interests me for our listeners is just to note how quickly the tectonic plates have shifted. Yeah. But what about like Latvia and Estonia and Lithuania and stuff? Are you saying they're being kind of offered up almost? Or, no, or they were be? offered up in the so the Molotov Ribbentrop Pact yeah. Yeah. was basically a secret deal between Germany and the Soviet Union. It terrified the Brits because the Atlanticists, i.e., the Brits and the Americans, have always wanted to cleave a gap between Russia and Germany, mm. which is why going all the way back, John, to Castlereagh, after mm. the Napoleonic Wars, the alliance was always England, France with Russia. Yeah. A bizarre alliance yeah. because Russia was such an unbelievably backward country and Britain and France were advanced countries. But of course, their alliance was to keep the Russians away from the Germans. Yeah. Their big fear was the Germans would do an alliance with the Russians, right? And that has basically dominated NATO thinking and dominated all sorts of other thinking for a long, long time. What fascinates me is A, this has moved so quickly, and B, the echoes of what I would call Russia and Germany doing a deal behind the backs of the East Europeans, the Central Europeans, mm. is kind of part of history. Mm. It happens a lot. Now, fascinatingly, Zelensky said that this has opened a Pandora's box. Now, we forget what a Pandora's box was. The Pandora's box was Zeus's punishment to humans for getting fire. This is in the classic world, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. Remember our Prometheus gave fire to the humans yeah. and the poor old Prometheus was stuck in a rock in Georgia where a buzzard ate out his liver every single day yeah. live, but the liver grew back. So the liver was eaten again and again and yeah, again, yeah. right? Yeah. But why? Because he gave fire to the humans. Yeah. So that was the punishment that Zeus yeah, meted out to Prometheus. Pretty brutal, all right. Pretty brutal. Yeah. Pretty, pretty, pretty Putinesque, okay? Yeah. On the other hand, the Pandora's box was the box that Zeus left humans to open. And the humans had been in the Garden of Eden prior to that where everything was, it was like a, a beautiful trip. Yeah. It was like the best acid trip you ever had. You're <laughs> warm, fuzzy, everything's lovely. It's colors, it's lights. You can almost see your own yeah. imagination. Plenty of Mars bars. Loads of Mars bars, right? Pandora's box <laughs> comes with death, pain, sorrow, all the factors that make life and of course, the, painful. And of course, the only thing that was left in Pandora's box when they put the, the lid back on was hope. Exactly. Yeah. Eggs. You're absolutely right. So what Zelensky has said is, this is what's coming down. Mm. This is what's coming down the track. Now, it could be dramatic, it could be classical, it could be theatrical, but the point is Trumpism is shifting the world. Mm. And that brings us back to our crowd here. Yeah. Right? Because you can see it as Europeans. We can see what is actually happening, right? If you choose to look. It's yeah. all about choosing to look. Now, we are in an election, which is in two weeks' time. And what you would hope is that somebody in the political hierarchy yeah. would say, hold on a second, we are going into a rather uncertain time. We have money in the bank. We need to spend that money over time on productive investment. The last thing we can do is throw that money around like confetti, buying off the electorate. Why? Because it might not necessarily be here all the time. Mm. So the way in which you insure against money not being here all the time is not put it on deposit and wait for a rainy day. It's actually use it to create productive infrastructure off which a stream of income flows into perpetuity. Yeah. Right? Yeah. But what are they doing? They're buying Mars bars. Mars bars, John. So this podcast is the Mars barization of the <laughs> Irish election, right? This is where we're going. And we will talk to you 
about jelly tops, <laughs> Mars bars, curly whirlies, curly whirlies, <laughs> and the one I never liked, bounties. Ah, no. All right. They're finished. You can't get bounties anymore. You can. You can get mini ones. I had them last night. <laughs> <laughs> so apart from bounty bars. <laughs> mini bounties, please, mini John. Mini bounty bars. Mini bar- do, you know where, do you know where they came from? Remember I bought all the sweets for Halloween? Yes. And no kids turned up. <laughs> so I'm sitting like Jab of the Hut watching. <laughs> Buzzing over your head with a massive sugar okay. rush. <laughs> Contemplating the sugar rush that is me, but also the sugar rush that is happening yeah. in Ireland. And then those little bits of coconut getting stuck the in your teeth. A little bit of coconut and you just realise I never like coconut. <laughs> I never... I didn't. But give me more. Give me more, yeah, yeah, yeah. So you, that is the image that the podcast should uh, express of me. But the point is the following, John. Right now, we are moving into uncertain times our political class should be saying, no, just say no. Do you remember, speaking of American presidents? Yes. Do you remember Ronald Reagan's Mrs. Nancy? Yes, right? I do, yeah. Just say no to drugs, yeah. right? And Not that great ad with the fried egg on the pan. <laughs> Don't remember that one. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and it's morning in America, right? Yeah. Just, if an Irish politician could get up and say no, we cannot do this. We should not do this. We ought not to do this. And we're not going to do it. Do what? Spend money freely. I'm going to give you the list, right? Right. Okay, since the mini-budget, right? I've been looking at some of the manifestos. Since the mini-budget, this is what's beginning of it. Right, this, is, this is the late, late show approach. This is one for everyone in the audience, yes. right? Okay? <laughs> there has been energy credits. Every household is going to get three free energy credits of 150 euros each. Child benefit payments, a double payment of child benefit, right? This is such a bribe, right? Scheduled for December. Yeah. A fuel allowance lump sum. Recipients of a fuel allowance will receive one off payment of 300 quid. A living alone allowance. A social welfare double payment. A one off lump sum payment. This is 400 euro payment for recipients of the working family payment. There's 400 euro payment for those receiving the care support. There's 400 euros for individuals on disability allowances, individual pensions, and blind pensions. There's 100 euros payment for qualified child for families receiving an increase in qualified child benefit. Okay, there's 12 euros weekly increase in social welfare, tax relief. There's an increase in the rent tax credit from 500 to 750. Education support, there's a one-off reduction. One-off is a great one, right? Because yeah, one-off yeah. means, here's the bribe, look the other way. Yeah. If they gave this stuff in brown envelopes, it would be more honest, right? Yeah. There's a one-off reduction of 1,000 euros in the student contribution fee to higher education. There's a 33% reduction in the contribution fee for apprentices in higher education, right? This is all in the, la- the mini-budget, yeah. right? Now... The party's freebie promises for the election, Fine Gael. Energy bill reductions proposes lowering the eligibility age for the household benefit package from 70 to 66. Pension increases, family care increases, child benefit enhancements, housing initiatives, state pension increases, rent tax credit. I can go on. This is just Fine Gael. Sinn Féin, <laughs> housing and childcare, advocates and affordable housing solutions to everyone through more freebies not detailed yet. Yeah. Social Democrats, affordable childcare, and people before profit. This list goes on for hours. For They're, they're looking for a four-day week now. Yeah. Like, what is going on? Additional bank holidays, right? I love this. <laughs> okay. I'm kind of all up for that, actually. Okay, I am. But look, again, it's just, the, the Greens are great. Public transport fare reductions, I'm up for that, right? Yeah. Light rail developments. Okay, at least this is one. Yeah, a carry cup for everybody. A carry cup, yeah, exactly. <laughs> I go on and on and on, right? Mac, hang on a second. I, I get that, and I think each one of those in themselves is not a bad thing. And I know they're trying to address this cost of living crisis and all the rest. So from that perspective, it's all fair enough. But I take your point that, why is this just happening now? Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Know, I mean, that is it. it so, is. So, so basically what it is, it's basically treating the adult population as infants, yeah. right? It's basically saying, we have a deal together with you guys, right? Which is, we will give you Everything you want. So imagine you're a child and you go into Tyndall's sweet shop in Monkstown. Right? Mm. Remember that one when we were kids, right? And you or say Hewitt's, which is now gone. Hewitt's was just gone, right? And you say, I want everything there. Yeah. Mammy. Yeah. And then you have a choice as a parent. Do you 
acquiesce to this and give in to this, yeah. okay? Or do you say, you know what? No, you can only have one of those. And the child says, but mommy, you've lots of money. And you say, well, the mummy in mommy's purse mm. needs to go a long way, etc. right? Yeah. It's the idea of saying no. So Napoleon, a man we quote as regularly as Stalin, friend of the podcast, <laughs> Hitler, friend of the podcast, mm. J.M. Keynes, friend of the podcast, right? <laughs> they're all in the fan club. <laughs> they're all, <laughs> exactly, they're all Patreons, okay? <laughs> but Napoleon said, to govern is to choose. You have to make choices between various different yeah, options yeah. and hope that those choices are between good and bad rather than between bad and worse, right? But yeah. that's the essential alchemy of governments. You choose. Mm. Once a government stops choosing, once it says yes to everything, I mean, in this general rule in life, I don't trust people who say yes to everything. Mm. I like certain people who are slightly cussed and awkward and say no. Yeah. Right, I kind of trust them more. I think that at the end of the day, they'll, they'll have your back more. They will actually do the right thing. Well, as long as they've thought it through, whatever no, it is. Like, I can't do that at the moment, right? Yeah. But I'll come back to you. It's a good mm. idea, but we can't just do it at the moment, but I'll come back to you, right? What we have is, rather than a government which should become an exercise in judicious choices, yeah. we have governments that's really a jamboree in excessive facilitation. I will facilitate everything. Now, obviously... During an election, these promises are kind of written on the back of a beer mat. Mm. And they may or may not be delivered, yeah. right? But what it does show you is that everything is driven for a short-term sugar rush, right? As if the people are dumb, as if we don't understand what's going on, yeah. as if we too are complicit. And I think a politician who gets up and says, hold on a second, what's happened in America imperils a business model that we have. Mm. Number one, the Americans want their money back. Number two, they want their capital back. Number three, they don't like big pharma, and we like big pharma. And number four, any money we have, we should be spending on stuff that makes us productive. Yeah. Right? I think that politician would but, actually be much more credible. But right? is, is it the real issue here, when you boil it down, between all the parties, that there is no true ideological difference between any of them? Because what's needed in the country is housing, infrastructure, and, and everybody and agrees. Transport. And yeah, transport. transport. The, the whole lot. But So everybody agrees more or less where we should be going with a vision of the future. So they're just trying to differentiate themselves with these little Mars bars and bounty bars and... Twixes. And, and I, prefer, prefer, I prefer Twix myself, yes. Yeah. But isn't that it? There's, there's a lack of difference between them. But wouldn't it be interesting if somebody would join up the thinking and say, look, the last 30 years we've done exceptionally well financially, commercially, and I think culturally from being a small player in this massive international game, which is underpinned by free trade, mm. free movement of goods, free movement of people, free movement of capital, and free movement of ideas. Yeah. Last Wednesday week, that world came to a shuddering halt. We now are going to be charged with, or we are adv advertising ourselves to run this country for the next four years. So the next four years, may well be a very different four years. Yeah. And as a result of that, we can't match your man's bid, but we may well be able to come back to it. But what yeah. we can promise you is that we won't squander all the money straight yeah. away. What our politicians have also done is they've misdiagnosed something fundamental about the world, which is the following. When we were poor and when unemployment was very, very, very high in this country, the Holy of Holies was full throttle economic growth, which would absorb in unemployed people and give people hope and a stake in society. Yeah. So the objective was let's run the economy as hot as we can to achieve the solution to unemployment, which will then achieve solutions to lots of other things. Mm. When you're in a situation with really high immigration and full employment, running the economy as hot as you can, which is what we're doing, not only does not deliver social peace, 
but creates a whole host of other problems. Yeah. So we are yeah. fighting the war today with the tactics of the last war, which is, we all know, the great mistake of generals, right? Mm. That running the economy as hot as you can only makes sense when the economy is underperforming. When the economy is outperforming, what you want to do is take the heat out of the economy. And you want to say to people, we're going to do things that will hopefully, over the next 10 years, bear down on house prices, mm. make house prices more affordable, make homes more available. We're going to, as they say in football, stand on the ball in the middle of the park. Don't mm. panic. So what I think is that not only is the inability to link the world to our present situation lamentably exposed by what we're seeing, but more interestingly, Irish politicians are running the economy as if it is 1994, not 2024. Yeah. And they think that they will get elected by running the economy at maximum capacity, where it's actually maximum capacity that's creating the problems. Yeah. Can I just you say see what I mean? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. But when you're talking about not giving away all these goodies and instead saying no to that, but yes to building infrastructure and housing and all the rest, the problem is that they don't have a good record at all in building that's, that and, is, and sorting uh, like children's hospital and all that kind of stuff. That's true, that's true. But the point is we are witnessing, and I come back to it, an election which I think maybe more than any election I can remember seems to me to be a giveaway, potato, cheese and onion, Twix election mm. to everyone. And you might as well put pints in on top of that for the crack, right? Yeah. At a time when the society is yearning for some clarity, some vision, and the vision that might actually require us to make sacrifices yeah. and say, do you know what? We've got to hold on. Yeah. And every single day, I mean, we are two weeks after the election, John. Yeah. What we can definitely say for certainty that every single day there's going to be another giveaway, another giveaway, another giveaway. Mm. And what that does, it reveals to me a real lack of any sort of responsibility. And imagination? Imagination and responsibility and what I call kind of a little bit of metal, a little bit of grit, mm. a little bit of hardness. And of course, if you infantilize the population and you allow the population to become infantilized, John, what happens if you don't deliver all the sweets is the child has a tantrum. Yeah. And the child having a tantrum is what we can expect in the next few years simply because all these promises can't be delivered on. Yeah. So the country then becomes reduced to a hyper-needy child that wants everything, yeah. but can't get everything. And right now, I think, in an election, if somebody stood up and said, look, guys, the world has changed, that politician would get far more votes than the politician who says, don't worry, we'll just keep feeding the monster. Mm. And that's where we're at. But, like... Is there anything that we can learn from the American election? I mean, one of the things that that yeah. when, I, when we, we were talking about this earlier about, you know, the appointments to Trump's cabinet and all the rest. I mean, I would love to get, as much as I despise the man, Elon Musk, but I'd love to get a doge in there, you know, Department of Government Efficiency, you know, so you don't end up with a children's hospital nonsense or a bicycle shed costing the, the price yeah, of a, of yeah. a semi-detached house and all that kind of stuff. Do you know, what can we learn from do, the American Well, I think, I think we can learn from the American election. We'll finish here. And I want to talk about immigration on mm. Thursday because this is a huge, huge issue. Uh, I think we can learn that the American election is a signal to the political establishment that something is broken. Right. Yeah. So it, were, it is a signal. It is a sign that something deep in the political, economic, social construction that we have put together over the last 40 years is broken. That, I think, is the sign, which is why I actually think this election in Ireland will throw up a few surprises that people are not necessarily factoring in. 
Yeah. At the moment, all the polls are saying, oh, don't worry, it's going to be Fianna Fáil, Fianna Gael. It may well be. Yeah. But what we can learn from America is that if the system is not delivering, and it may not be delivering for one reason for one person, a totally different reason for another person, the signal will be a voter revolution. Yeah. And I don't mean a revolution in the yeah. song culotte you know, but like, as, as one of my daughters said to me the other night, it's going to be like the Kamala effect. You know, her her last ad was, don't tell your husband, you know, to the women, don't tell your husband that you're voting for Kamala. But they Whereas, didn't. But they didn't. <laughs> but this is going to be like, don't tell your parents that you're voting for Sinn Féin. <laughs> well, that's a very South Dublin way to end, John. <laughs> Beautifully South Dublin way to end. We'll talk to you Thursday. Ever thought about owning your own company or even owning the company you work in? This segment is going to interest you because it's a partnership we've done with Employee Ownership Ireland. And they're people whose ambition is an Ireland where everyone has the opportunity to own where they work. It's fascinating. I'm now going to talk to a very interesting chief executive, Alan Coleman, and what he did at Wolfgang Digital and how other companies might follow suit. Alan, how are you? Great to see you. Very good, David. Thanks very much. Not at all. Tell me about Employee Ownership and then Employee Ownership Ireland. Sure. So I recently made one of the biggest decisions in my business career and it was all around succession. So for any business owner, succession is possibly the biggest decision I make. They say there's two certainties in life, David, death and taxes. For business owners, there's a third. You know, you're going to have to decide who gets this after you go. So when I looked into the options for Irish businesses, I was dismayed. You know, there's two options. There's keep it in the family or there's the big sale to the big company. Yeah. In terms of keep it in the family, we've all seen the TV show Succession. You know, spoiler yes. alert. Yes, Doesn't yes. work out John, well for John the John is a big fan. John uh-huh. is a big fan. John, John is the Kendall Roy of podcasting. <laughs> so it's a tale as old as time. Tends not to work out very well. The big sale to the big company. Now, this is what success looks like for a lot of entrepreneurs. And we've been you know, entertaining those approaches for about a decade now. And it was very exciting at first, but when I really eyeballed the deal, it felt more like death than success to me. Like really the company just becomes a profit center and your culture is probably going to die. Any investments you're making in the people in the work are probably going to, you know, suffer as well. So I was dismayed at the options available to me. And then I learned in the UK, there's this employee ownership trust model, which has become very popular there in the last decade. And put it simply, the employees all become co-owners of the business. They have a say in how the work is done, and they share in the profits from work well done. So once I heard about this as an option, I got really excited and thought, oh, I, I feel this is the best foot so forward for us. Just come back. So tell me, Wolfgang Digital is the company, right? And you were the chief executive. It was your baby. Correct. And then yeah. you decided, based on people listening might know John Lewis, the retailer in the UK, not only from its very good Christmas ads, but the fact that it's probably one of the oldest, as you say, employee ownership models. So you sold the company to your own former employees who are now shareholders. Exactly. So the way it works is a trust is set up. Okay. And everybody who's working in the company is now a partner in the trust. Okay. So the leadership structure in the business still runs the business day to day, but the trust has acquired shares. So we've sold 25% to to the trust. We used retained profits. So you use your profits to finance the deal. Right. So the way it's going to work for those, so that means they are now, they're minority owners. Every year we'll do another transaction in the yep. future. They'll be majority owners. So as owners, they now have a responsibility and reward in how the business is won. So for example, in a couple of months, we're going to do a, a wolf's den, like a dragon's den, David, yep. where everybody comes together and they pitch their ideas to the management on how they'd strengthen the business. And we're going to adopt a few. We're going to, just like Dragon said, we're going to finance them, you know, set aside money to finance this. So that's one of the ways they'll exercise voice in how the business is run. Then the other part of ownership, of course, is reward. So they're getting a profit share. So we've had two profit shares so far. It's a percentage uplift on basic salary. So, so far it's averaged 9%. Okay. So over a year, if they get an 8% uplift, they've worked 12 months and they've got paid for a 13th. So in terms of when they buy the shares and the trust, money goes from where to where? Just so I really get the idea, because I'm trying to, it's, it's kind of an internal sale rather than an external sale, if you look at it. That's right. That's right. So the way it's done in the UK, David, is it's a, it's a loan from the seller to the buyer based on future profits. Okay. So the okay. way it's done there is, let's say the company's valued at 5 million, makes a million a year in profits. Every year for the next uh, five years, they might give all or 
in reality, what happens is every year over the next seven years, they'll give the majority of the profits to the owners as the payoff. So that's how it's done. It's loan based in the UK. We went a different way. We went profit based. So instead of looking at future profits, we went, we'd retained profits. So we used a chunk of retained profits. It looks like a pension contribution, but we gifted the trust the okay. retained profits. It looks like a pension contribution. They use that money to buy the shares from us. Okay. Uh, the shareholders. I mean, this sounds like, again, a very clever way of one, spreading the love, spreading the wealth, and two, making sure that the best employees have a stake in a position, in a company that they used to just take a wage from. Exactly. So my big bet is that when the responsibility of ownership and the rewards of ownership are distributed throughout the company, the the company gets stronger. Okay. And that's how it works. And the more senior, the more, because the profit share is paid as an uplift on basic salary, it means that your most senior people, you know, or the We'll, we'll get a larger amount, you know, real amount, and the more junior people, it'll be great. It'll be a nice uplift for them, but they'll be earning their way in to a bigger profit share year on year on year on year. And and is this something that most companies now in Ireland can look at? So this was the problem, David. So I fell in love with the idea. I uh-huh. desperately wanted to do it. I sought professional advice and I was told, no, never been done, can't be done. So I interrogated that and I said, well, why can't it be done? And they said, well, if you do this, you're going to put your hand up for a number of taxes that you wouldn't put your hand up for otherwise. If you did the big sale, you wouldn't put these, or if you just kept going as you're going, you're going to have new taxes. So for me, I'm, I'm, I'm a really big believer in this idea. And the big bet I made is we're going to outgrow the tax bill. So I believe that we're on a new trajectory of growth because everybody is skin in the game. Yep. A lot of the young people who work for me fear they'll never own where they live. They now own where they work. I think that matters. It does matter, yeah. So our big bet is that we will outgrow the tax bill we put our hand up for. So a lot of Irish companies have said, I love the idea. How do you do it? And when I tell them about the tax bill, they go... And what's the tax bill? Explain that to me. So in the UK, there's no capital gains tax on a sale to your employees. Right. In Ireland, rather than playing capital gains, you play income tax. So you go from basically 30% to 50% tax and you don't get any entrepreneur's relief. Then in the future, when I pop me clogs, right, when, when I die, there'll be a new tax, an inheritance tax on the business that'll have to pay a chunk of the profits every year from that perspective. Wow. So the Irish tax system actively discriminates against a wealth distribution service that actually gives employees a stake in businesses. Is that what you're telling me? Well, this is the really important point. So a Department of Finance Commission report, it's only at weeks recommended that the Irish government adopt the same tax incentives they have, have in the UK. They could see the benefits of this. They want to do it. The big problem that the Irish government has now, well, one, one of them, and there's a lot of problems there, but w- one of them is that they want to build, they want to rebalance the economy away from multinationals towards Absolutely. homegrown Irish Absolutely. businesses. And, and this is something we need to do. So the big problem they have is every week, three Irish businesses are sold into overseas ownership. And this figure has doubled in recent years. So, and the, the, the people who are buying these, the private equity funds, the multinationals, they're not buying the duds, David. You know, these, these are the, the best performing Irish businesses are been sold at a rate of three a week to overseas buyers. So we know when vulture funds are buying our property, that's bad. You know, when the private equity funds are buying the best Irish businesses, that's also bad for the economy and society. Well, completely, because they're, I mean, they're, their metrics are the least socially cohesive metrics. I mean, if you want to find Milton Friedman's shareholder value on steroids, you look private equity. And what this podcast has been saying for a long, long time is that companies are part of the ecosystem. Not exactly. just you won't find private equity funds sponsoring the local GAA club, David. You probably will not. You probably will not. Yeah, no, I, no, I hear you. Job cuts. I hear you. Yeah. I hear you. And so yeah. just, just before we go, Alan, explain to me, in Ireland, the tax system is now arguing against this form of shared ownership. So the good news is the legal system doesn't need any edits or re-regulation. The Employee ownership trusts can live in the Irish legal system. Currently, the tax system is not incentivizing it, it's penalizing it. I've spoken to a lot of business owners and they would bite your arm off for the possibility to be able to sell into their people. Yeah, of course. Rather than sell out to the big company or the competition. It's kind of Marx without the Marxism, which is what I like, you know, that workers own the commanding heights of the economy without the revolution. That's it. Yeah, yeah. So it's revolutionizing ownership. 
You know, that's that's the core thing. And, and on revolution, so the key difference is in a corporation, the legal objective of the business is to maximize shareholder wealth. Yes. The legal objective of an employee ownership company is to be run for the benefit of the employees. So when yeah. you think about that, who do you want to own the AI? You want your own people. Yeah, you want the people. They're going to look to build a better product run but by it, people. But it also, you cre- you're creating an entrepreneurial culture in a country that needs an entrepreneurial culture. You're creating a, what I call owner responsibility in a country that requires owner responsibility. And you're creating what I would say, and every country and every company needs this, a path to wealth acquisition that is now debarred out of the housing market for many, many young people. That's it. People can't, a lot of people fear they can't own where they live, but this gives them the opportunity to own where they work. So listen, before we let you go, Alan, where can people find out more about Employee Ownership Ireland? Well, if they Google employee ownership, they'll find material there. Unfortunately, because there's not much in Ireland, the best place to find it is from the Employee Ownership Association of the UK. And they've loads of material there, Irish Pro Share Association too. But the big thing for people to do is to urge their candidates this election to bring employee ownership to Ireland. We have the recommendation to the Department of Finance. Nothing happens without political action. So I'd urge people who care about it. Actually, you their, know what? We'll get right behind that. I mean, this podcast isn't usually, usually getting behind a political issue, but we'll definitely get right behind that. For sure, absolutely. Because that is, it's an issue that I think is on the table and many, many companies would find this a far better exit than, as you say, selling out to a faceless private equity company based out of New York that, in effect is an extractive industry. It extracts value and gives it to one person as opposed to reinstating value and giving it to lots of people. Alan, great to talk to you. We'll see you again. We will certainly get behind this one. Thanks so much, David. That was a great chat with Alan, wasn't it? Yeah, it was really interesting stuff. You know, we don't normally support political causes on this podcast. I think that's... It's more of a tax cause. It's a tax... Well, yes, we'd love to support tax causes. So that's... Alan Coleman from Employee Ownership Ireland. I think it could be an episode in itself. And if this has sparked your interest, consider reaching out to your local party candidate to learn more about how they're engaging with this initiative. See you soon.